Yeah. So, uh, Terry and I have known each other for uh, many years, uh, 20 years or something. We started teaching at Cuyamaca together in the late 1990s. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as I think many of you know, she's Cuyamaca has been on the forefront of uh, the prerequisite support uh, uh, movement in mathematics. And uh, largely what we're doing is following, uh, you know, in their footsteps. And so. <laughs> Dangerous. Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andrew will watch you. Yeah, okay. so, so anyway, um, thanks again for being here. The first two hours, just to reiterate, the first two hours is going to be more of a kind of an overview, and um, and uh, I mean, you're still going to be doing activities, but the, the the afternoon we're going to have lunch, and then the afternoon session is going to be very focused on uh, the. Uh, intermediate algebra support and statistics with support because those are the classes we're going to start teaching in the fall. All right, so uh, I also wanted to uh, introduce uh, my wife who has uh, come today as well. This is Donna. And Don and I worked together as well for years. Yes. So we're Donna in the same department. Were, they were kind of the rebels in the department. We uh, were. For, for many years trying to push the envelope and do some different things. And uh, uh, So Donna is uh, uh, currently teaching at the Chafee College. Woo! So. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter's here somewhere too. So if you see an 11-year-old uh, girl wandering around, that's Julia. She's... Uh, She's here to uh, experience uh, this event as well. So, thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to turn it over to Terry. Okay. Go! All right. So, thank you for being here. The presentation, I am going to do basically a presentation. We'll have some group work within it this morning, uh, but the afternoon will be all activity based. So, I apologize for talking at you a little bit. I also apologize if some of you have seen parts of this roadshow. Tammy Marshall and I uh, share our slide presentations, you know, we don't know really who's created which presentation anymore. But for those of you that haven't seen the roadshow yet, I wanted you to have some background. So uh, just to reiterate what the problem is, for, whenever, for every 100 hopeful souls who enter the math pipeline of doom at three or le more levels below transfer, six of them get out through a transfer level course. So in other words, you have students that have come to college. They're risking being in college. They're probably scared to be here. They have dreams, a goal that they want to achieve. And we say 90 to 94 of them, we say no, because they can't get through the math pipeline. That's why I call it the math pipeline of doom. Um, more importantly, uh, placement is destiny. If you're placed one level below transfer in the state of California, 35% get through a transfer level course. If you play, place two levels below transfer, 15% get through a transfer level course. If you place three or more levels below transfer, 6% get through a transfer level course. And here's what I mean by placement is destiny. And here's the foundation of the equity gap. Half, more than half, of our black and Latinx, isn't Latinx the new trendy word? Okay, half of black and Latinx students in California place three or more levels below transfer. So it's my proposition to you today that the math pipeline of doom is the cornerstone of the equity gap. The equity gap is built on that. And this is from the basic skills cohort tracker. So, um, Given that, Cuyamaca College recognized that we had a choice. Uh, we could either continue to believe that students were incapable of doing college level work, transfer level work, without multiple layers of remediation, or we could choose to believe in student capacity and uh, to do college level work with just a little extra support. And that's the co-requisite support model. I have to stop here just for a second. At Cuyamaca College, we kept having to fly under the radar because things weren't okay with the transfer institutions. So we kept having to do things, kind of find a backdoor way to do things where we didn't upset the transfer institutions. So we don't call them co-requisite support models. We call them concurrent enrollment support. So I'll accidentally slip into that language. I try to use co-requisite because that's what the world knows. So at Cuyamaca, 
We chose to recognize students' capacity to do the work with some support and then provide students with an achievable pathway to realizing education's promise, right? To achieving their goals. So in doing that, we came up with three high leverage. We didn't come, ah, bad, Terry. Um, actually, a lot of you, how many of you have been to the California Acceleration Project uh, workshops that Katie and Myra put on? Okay, well, seven years ago, I went to, I was in that first cohort, and uh, they suckered me about a year later, uh, maybe a few years later. They invited me to do this special, to attend a special presentation. I kept saying, no, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. Uh, they invited 10 colleges. Finally, they said, I'll pay for your hotel room and pay to board your dogs. I said, okay, I'll go. And they presented these three high level strategies. And at the end of the weekend, they asked the 10 folks that were there, which one are you going to implement? I knew the right answer, all three, right? So I'm like, no, choose me, choose me. And we're all sitting in a circle, and they choose the person next to me and go around. So I'm like, oh, I'm last. I'm not going to get to give the right answer. Well, no one all the way around said all three. They all picked one, right? They got to me, and I was like beaming, ha, all three. And Katie and Myra sort of had this weird look on their face. I couldn't understand what it was. Well, years later, after an intense amount of work and some face plants and uh, some pain, uh, because we launched from idea to do these three high-level strategies to implementing our co-requisite support models and completely change our, our whole program was 14 months. So, and there was no one to model after, right? So I have to tell you it hurt, it, it was painful. And so then I realized their look on their faces and that's, uh, their favorite joke is, yeah, that's why we invited you. We knew you'd want to give the right answer. <laughs> Put all three up there. So that's how we got sucked into doing it. So the, just to verbally say it, because some people are audio learners, uh, we, AB 705 didn't exist at the time. Um, so it was spring 14, spring 2014, when I saw these high leverage strategies brought them back to my department. And so there was no AB 705 yet. So change placement policies to allow more students to just directly enroll into transfer level courses. Um, accelerate remediation, that, that would be those pre-SACS classes that you're hearing about and things like that. Some people call compacted courses where you take pre-algebra and beginning algebra and squeeze them into a same course as acceleration, but we don't define acceleration that way. Acceleration is badly designed and you remove content that's not necessary. And I'll talk more about that this afternoon. And then there it is, concurrent enrollment support models. And it's not AM705, it's AB705. Spell check. Okay. So we'll talk more about these. So changing placement policies, one of the things that we implemented right away is we counsel students into one of our math pathways. And I'll show you the pathways later. Um, based on their meta major general, business, STEM, technical, and education. And uh, there's a lot of training that went on in counseling, and, and it's, it, you don't get to just, you know, you shouldn't just change one, train once, it's always ongoing. Uh, and we thought, oh, we just have to train folks once. And you know, they get, they slip back into the old model of trying to counsel them into a, a typical math pathway. If you're not continually cha training folks to counsel students by meta major. Okay, now these in-math rules, uh, because we're in a district and our sister college didn't want to change placement policies when we were ready to change placement policies, spring 2014, when we were imagining all of this, we could only implement these placement policies on our co-requisite support courses. And I just want you to think about this slide and then when I show you how our co-requisite support courses are set up, I'll explain how this applies to the transfer level courses. Uh, I, we've now decided this is way too high and uh, that this is not as a good predictor based on our data as just looking at high school GPA. And all of um, our uh, multiple measures like this are self-reported. So we just have students self-report. We give them, you know, do you think you're, which of the five GPA ranges do you think your high school GPA was in to the best of your recollection? And our theory is, and it's pretty predictive of success, and our theory is students just pick a number that sort of measures them as a student, 
you know, it's a way for them to tell us what they think of themselves as a student. And it's, it's working pretty well. That's just a theory. We just know that using high school GBA is working really well to place students in transfer level classes with support. And then um, all students, 100% of incoming students, are eligible for intermediate algebra with support, our pre stats class, which we're actually trying to accelerate past now, and transfer level st statistics with support. 100% of students can get into statistics with support. So accelerate remediation, our longest, so, so we completely, we didn't phase in, and we didn't phase in our program and phase out the traditional path pipeline because uh, just by implementing the pre stats course seven years ago, we rec recognize systems don't do optional. Like you, you can't, DSPS counselors didn't believe at that time that students could do pre-statistics and they kept wanting, wanting to put them into pre-algebra. So that, you know, we kept saying, no, 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 they belong in pre-statistics and then statistics, don't put them in math pipeline and do them. And then when we decided to go with our co-requisite model, um, we decided not to do optional. We just eliminated the math pipeline of doom. So we just took out of our schedule pre-algebra, beginning algebra, we kept intermediate algebra only for STEM students. And so our longest sequence through a transfer level course now is two semesters. But the vast majority of students go straight into a transfer level course. The vast majority. A very small number of students uh, take this intermediate algebra course with or without support or the pre staff course. Most go into here. Okay, so uh, here's, I'm not going to show you all of the math pathways, like the education pathway I'll leave out, but I'm going to give you some examples. Oh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me. Like, you don't have to raise your hand, just blurt out any questions you have. Um, I feel like you won't be able to concentrate if you don't ask what you need to have answered right in the media. So general education pathway, our pre-stats course is six units. We started out with being, it being eight units, uh, but we made a decision to make it so part-timers could teach a pre-stats course and a stats course and still stay within 10 units. To drop this to six, I wish we would have kept it at eight because I'm a little bit pressured to get through at least two thirds of the material. We, we have other optional, we have some units that are optional in the book that we, we wrote. So six units for that. And then uh, this is, I mean, these are pathways for students identified as underprepared, right? So these are not pathways for students that come in and are identified as prepared for college level work. So regardless of where they place, three or more levels below transfer, you know, wherever, they can take pre-stats followed by statistics with or without support. And the units are listed here. Statistics at our college is four units. The support course is two units. And statistics with or without support, they can just go straight in there. They don't have to do the pre-stats. Any questions right now? We don't have any questions about how the co-requisite support courses works in conjunction with the transfer level course? Anyone? Did you want to know about that? You bet. It's, it's rapid, I call it a wraparound course. So in other words, I teach stats with support. The support course is either scheduled right before the stats class or right after in the same room. So stats would normally be two hours a day, two days a week. The support course would be one hour a day, two days a week. The students experience just a three hour course twice a week. All the students who are in my stats class are in my support course. All the students in my support course are in my staff course. There are, it feels like one course. The students don't even, you know, after the first week, they don't think of themselves as being enrolled in two courses. They feel like they're just enrolled in stats and they don't understand when they're getting remediated. You know, when we call it getting remediated. The remediation is interwoven. So there's no moment where the students feel like, oh, I'm in the support course now oh, I'm in the stats course now. They just feel like they're in stats, and when they go out into the tutoring, tutoring center or they interact with other folks on campus, they don't say I'm in Math 60 and Math 160. Math 160 is stats, 60 is the support course. They just say I'm in Math 160. They perceive themselves, don't worry, you're not, blurt it out. 
Uh, I have a question. Uh, after two hours of teaching, do you have a right to say a five minutes or ten minutes break for the students? Yeah, so she's asking about a break when you're in a three hour class, and I'm going to reinterpret that question is how the hell do you get through a three hour class in a day? Um, of course, you have a break, a um, 10 minute break. You can do it whenever you want. You know? um, three hours flies by. I don't, I don't, you, the students always go, the time's up. Wait, wait. And I go, I'm out of time. I never feel like I'm having, you know, it, it doesn't, those three hours don't loom. You know, uh, before the way that we teach, and it's because of the way we teach now, before changing, having a paradigm shift in the way that we teach, uh, if I, you know, back in the day when I straight lectured long, like way back, Don and I kind of started teaching this way a long time ago. Long before when I first came out of school and started lecturing, if I taught a five unit class and I knew I was going to have a two and a half hour day, you know, two and a half hour lecture, it just loomed. You know, it just it weighed on me. Now the time flies by. And I'm going to show you some pictures of our classrooms in action. And one of our teachers, Scott Ecker, you know, was the lecturer in chief. He's now teaching this way and he is, he is evangelical over it. And, um, he used to, when we were planning this, he kept arguing. Because if, well, I'll show you the next slide. And I'll continue to answer your question. Can I just? Yes. So if, if the students are in the quad and you're saying, I'm in stats, how come you, you only need for two hours, I need for three hours? Are you clear with the students that have support that they're going to be in a class that's long? They know that when they enter, when they register, they have to enter, they, they register in two courses. They, you know, they, the counselors tell them, Online, they have to enroll. If they enroll in the 60 class, they they are automatically enrolled in the linked 160 class. Or if they enroll in the linked 160 class, they're automatically enrolled in 60. They don't. Uh, they can't get out of it. And that first week, we're very clear and explain. This is a three-hour class. It's going to be treated like one class. You have to pass the stats course in order to pass the support course. Like you know, I, I really only give them a stats grade, and then their support grade is based on that. So, yeah, they're clear. They're grateful that they're not in the math pipeline of doom. We've never had a student complain about it, that, that it's an extra hour of support. So the only students that complain is they want that stats class at that time. They, they don't, they're not uh, identified as underprepared, that that stats class at that time works in their schedule. You'll have every now and then that first semester or two that we did this, the student that comes in and says, I don't want to take the support course, just the stats course. And then you have to say it doesn't work like that. You know, you have to be in both. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I guess I'm just that they, you know, it's not fair. I could be in a class longer. Obviously, they're signing up for it. They know it, but I'm just, I'm, uh, you know. Yeah, so it's not fair. You're, you're, you don't want to, like, say, you guys are in the class that needs more support. You don't want to you stress that problem. No, you just say you're in stats with, uh, and instead of having to start at beginning algebra and take five minutes there, and then, I mean, intermediate algebra, I mean, pre algebra, take four units there, beginning algebra, take five units there. Intermediate algebra take another five minutes, and they come into stats. Instead of all those hours, you're just going to take these extra two hours a week, and we're going to factor design the remediation that you need. And they say thank you. They they don't they don't complain. You know they I you know I I'll give you a link to a video KPBS did a special on us, and uh, that first couple of weeks you always get a couple of students crying because they're so grateful that you know they. You know, they were going to give up, but they don't have to be in that pipeline of doom. You, you never get the, I don't want to do the two hours, unless it's someone who wants the class at that time, and they were identified as eligible just for straight up stats. They'll complain about the schedule. But they don't get in, so. Okay, so here's our business pathway. So uh, business calculus with support. So we didn't, we didn't just go the staff with support. We decided, again, to go all in uh, right off the bat. Stats with support followed by statistics, because you get the little bit of algebra that you might need, that you might need in here. Um, or they can do intermediate algebra. So it's from highest placement. They're all identified as underprepared. But this student might be identified as placing one level below transfer. So we just put them into the transfer level business calculus course with support instead of one level below. This student might be identified as two or three levels below transfer, um, or more. And then the students discover this route. Uh, they can't, if there are two or three or four levels below transfer, they don't get into this class. They probably get into this class. It's really based on high school GPA. 
Uh, so they would get into this class. They figured out, and it's just a colleague thing, they figured out going to stats with support and then they're eligible for business with support. We don't have enough that this is not an intended pathway. It's an accidental pathway. So we don't have enough. Our, our N isn't large enough yet to see if this is a valid pathway. So we'll keep you posted on that. Any questions about this one? Why does it automatically go to business calculus support? Well, they're business majors. So they've got to take stats and business calculus. Right. But why wouldn't it let them go directly into regular business calculus? Because it's not enough algebra. They, they have not met intermediate algebra. So the extra two units that you add on to statistics with support is not all of intermediate algebra. Okay. It's just enough to get through statistics. Okay. So you, you haven't met the pre intermediate algebra prerequisite for business calc. And then the STEM pathway, STEM students identified as underprepared. This would be the lowest placing based on high school GPA and previous course taking history. And this would be the highest. Uh, placing. And this is what I wanted to talk to you about the question, you know, the question about do you get a break? So if they take pre-calculus with support, right, they take pre-calculus with support, pre-calc at our school six units, and then the support course is two units. So that is an eight-hour course. There's no trig? No, no. Yeah, there's trig in pre-calc. We have, we have trig embedded in pre-calc. We have a college algebra as well, and it has support as well. We have college algebra with support. College algebra is four units. Pre-calculus is college algebra and trig together. So in this one course, they'll get college algebra, trigonometry, and they'll remediate whatever they need in the prerequisite material for that pre-calculus course. Y'all are thinking we're crazy, right? Yeah. Y'all are thinking, ain't no effing way that works. Uh, but, you know, we'll see. See what happens. I'll show you some data in a little while. So then they would come straight out of this eight unit course, right? Eight hours, four hours a day, two days a week. We tried the four days a week, two hours a day, four days a week. Students don't like it, and the teacher says it's not enough time. Uh, so we, we do this two days a week, four hours, and the time flies by. You, you just can't believe four, four hours is gone through. And then they go straight into Cal one. Okay, so how many students do we have at school? Um, we're tiny. Uh, I I don't know. We're like ten thousand, eleven thousand. No, 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 at school. Yeah. So so scheduling must be hard, you know, to schedule like four hours. Well, no, because you've taken out all those lower level courses, right? You've taken out the pre calculus, the, I mean the pre algebra, the beginning algebra. Those sections are gone, and you're actually replacing them with less units, which frees up more space. And then administrators, when we first were starting, uh, we had a VPI at the time that uh, when, when we presented this to him, he said, well, you can phase out the old pathway and phase in the new. And I sat there, my chair started arguing with him. I sat there and I thought, I got a year. We'll see what happens. And then we, uh, you know, I just, we just kept working like we were going to get to do it. Like, you know, regardless of the administration saying no, because they were worried about FTES coming. FTS went up, and we became more efficient. And so we'll, we'll show you that as well. How can you write a curriculum for pre-calculus that include uh, college algebra and also trigonometry? And that's the afternoon days. session. Uh, in the afternoon session today, I'm going to show you. You guys are going to do an activity that shows how we write this curriculum and how we deal with it. And, and I'm, so I don't want to give away the punchline. But that question I promised to answer this afternoon. The question was, how do you write the curriculum that basically includes, the question was, all the algebra, right? So in, our, in your imagination right now, you're assuming this course has uh, pre-algebra, beginning algebra, intermediate algebra, pre-calculus, and trig in it. That's what you're seeing, right? That's, that's where your mind's at. So I'm going to ask you this afternoon to challenge that assumption. Okay, so, so this afternoon now. Okay, so remember I said we thought, uh, we conceived of all of this in spring 2014. We had to write, rewrite all the curriculum for every course. There were no materials out in the world for us to use, so we had to invent materials. Um, we had to sell it. We had to hire a new president, get her to fire our vice president, 
and get a different vice president in there. Uh, get a different vice president in there who said yes. Actually, is that that BPI was still there when the new president came. So two weeks before her first day, we, we wrote this little paper. And we sent her this 10-page paper that I had written. And uh, we asked to get on her first, uh, what is it called, the president, president's cabinet meeting. So her very first president's cabinet meeting, you know, we asked to get to present it. So we, we strategized with our dean. It was the chair, me, and our dean. We're strategizing. We're figuring out, okay, if the president says this, we'll say this. Here, we'll use this slide of presentation if this happens. We're going to try to thwart the dean, the VP of student services and the VP of instruction if this happens, you know. She walks in, we're all there sitting, we've got our presentation up and ready to go, we've all got our contingency plans, we've reviewed them before we walked in, we planned for like three weeks in advance. She walks in with the paper and she goes, I drew a heart here, and I drew a heart and a flower here, and I have three amens right here. I'm sitting next to the BPI that said no, and I look at him, and I think at him, and he looks at me, I got hearts, dude, hearts. <laughs> And it was all downhill from that point in regard to fighting the administration. We have to fight other folks, and we'll we'll chat about that. Sorry, I almost took you out. Okay, so remember, inception, spring of 2014, um, fall of 2015. You know, we got to get all the curriculum in, right, and get it approved by the state because we want to launch fall of 16. And so. Of course, we don't have it. We got the curriculum done. We just made some stuff up and realized we'll, we'll edit it in spring of 26. I mean, a spring, wait, spring 2015, fall of 2015. Oh, it was spring 2015 when we invented all of this. Sorry. So, spring 2015, fall 2015, we've got to get everything in because we only have a year until fall 2016 when we're going to implement. So, erase everything I said about spring 2014. So, we knew that come fall 2016, we would be inventing things as we were launching this program because we decided not to do optional. And I came across this cartoon and it just describes that first semester and first year in flight construction. I, I just have to point this out. Look, here's the plans. The tools he needs to build it are falling off the plane. Like that is so our first year. And, um, but, Everything that we imagined could go wrong and we made contingency plans for didn't. And everything that we didn't think of that could go wrong did. And the prior the things that we thought were priorities worked. And you really don't set your priorities appropriately until you launch. So we had this saying at Cleomaca, if you need to prioritize, just get airborne, because that will tell you what you need to do. Because you got a land, right? So that's very clarifying, very clarifying. Okay, so we're gonna have a group work activity now.